a new realism. And for those of you that are interested, the catalog is available online on our website. If you wanna see more about the curatorial statement or the artist statements, there's a lot more to unpack there. But I wanna dive right into our conversation today. So we'll talk for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll leave about 10 minutes for questions. So even throughout the talk, my colleague Chris is monitoring the chat um, function on Zoom. And if you would like to place a question in there, please do as you're thinking about it. And if it relates to what Amanda and I are discussing, we'll address it and be able to answer it right away. Or we might save it for the end um, when we're done unpacking some of these main things in Amanda's work. So thank you all for being here. It's great to have you. And my name is Tammy Landis. I work here as museum educator at the Western Gallery. So we're gonna go ahead and dive right in with Amanda. Thanks for being here. Of course. Yeah, and Amanda's already graduated, so I should just <laughs> throw it out there. You know, these artists are coming in on their own time. They've, they've finished in the spring, but they've extended, you know, so much effort to be able to be here and to install the work. So congratulations. Thank you. You know, this is a major accomplishment and we're not gonna talk about it yet, but I, I do wanna come back to what this year mm -hmm. looked like for you because your BFA year, no one's had a BFA year like this. This has very much been a first. So we're going to unpack that a little bit as well. Um, but behind us, Amanda created a piece called The Dining Room. The Dining Room. Yes. yes. And I think most of you already might notice that this table is soaring above our heads. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the work, just some general themes of, you know, we have a dining table behind us. And it's, like I said, it's going over my head. But why did you make a dining table of this scale and size? I really like the idea of distorting a space, not only to create discomfort, but to also reflect my memories of the space from my adolescence. So instead of creating actuality, more of a representation of what I feel towards the space and sort of the mm. emotions that are connected to it. Mm. Uh, especially with this piece, I wanted to tackle a lot of the themes of dysfunctional eating habits and sort of where they come from and how, how are they formed, specifically my relationship with food since I'm the closest to it. So I really liked the idea of showing sort of the dysfunctional habits that I had and mm. contradicting the spaces where I hid food with the dining room, which it's basically the only purpose is to eat in public with your family mm. or friends. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's something to be said about, we all can recognize the dining room set, right? When mm -hmm. we walk in and the viewers, the people that have been coming in, they instantly gravitate to your piece. And I think it's also because of the scale, but they recognize it right away. Like I asked them, what do you recognize, but then what's off? And they all can articulate all these different memories and correlations to mm -hmm. the dining room. Um, but I think what's really important to show you all, and I know Chris is gonna be showing some details of this work. Um, and Chris, if you wanna pull up a few images of the, the tableware and the details of the ceramics that are on top. Um, I know we have some slides we can show, but could you tell us a little bit about the process of making this installation? Because you made this table, you made the pieces mm -hmm. that are sitting on top of the table that Chris is going to be showing us. Yeah, I first started with the ceramics because I had sort of an idea that it was going to be the most finicky of all of the processes I was going to be doing. Mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to break them and that sort of felt like the easiest part because ceramics tend to do that on their own mm. so really quick i just want to pause mm -hmm. you there so when you say you knew you wanted to make ceramics mm -hmm. and then you wanted to break it does yeah. that lead to your conceptual thoughts of That's like sort of how it formed yeah. in the fall i originally wanted to make um vessels because mm. i liked the idea of vessels but then I found them a little bit vague mm. um, in terms of the topics I wanted to talk about related to food. So that's sort of how I moved to dining wear in a table mm. setting. Mm. Uh, but I, from the beginning, I sort of enjoyed the idea mm. of breaking functional objects because mm -hmm. it just destroys their intended use. Mm. Yeah. And that sort of connects to how I feel like I feel about eating and its intended purpose versus my relationship mm. with eating and how it's sort of distorted. Mm -hmm. There's so much to unpack there with mm -hmm. like taking apart the functionality of this dining room. Mm -hmm. But so you were saying you started 
with the ceramic process. You liked yeah. vessels and then you were thinking about plates and then don't we all wanna break plates, <laughs> right? And like what that means to be able to control and also shatter and that emotion of, it feels so successful to yeah. do that. So talk us through, you know, so you started making these uh, table sets, the tableware, mm -hmm. and then deciding to break them and not show them in their whole presentation. Yeah, so, and I wanted to break them, but then I also wanted, I almost, I wanted to break them more than I could even do, which is sort of when I started experimenting with the glaze and creating um, the crackle design, which is actually, glazes aren't supposed to do that when yeah. they're on plates because food can get in there and it's gross. But I mm. liked the idea of even making, like keep pushing the lack of functionality in mm. them. And then that sort of kept growing because I have an inability to contain my ambitions sometimes <laughs> when it comes to projects. So then I went from creating a, di like a dining table or a dining set to an entire dining room because I really wanted to sort of surround the audience with mm. both familiarity and discomfort at the same time. Yeah, um, let's, let's pause there. So mm -hmm. um, I love that phrase that you just said, to surround the viewer, because mm -hmm. that absolutely happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say people I think are really interested if they can sit down on the dining they table. They can sit down. It's difficult to sit down, I'll yeah. be honest, but you can definitely do it. Yeah, um, maybe at the end we can have you like show us what it's like, like, you know, scale wise to go yeah. sit down at the end of you this. You do feel like a child. It's like the first time besides like maybe in a bar stool where my feet will not cut to the ground in yeah. the chair. So yeah, it's definitely takes you back to sort of feeling naturally uncomfortable as well, because even though it's a familiar space, it feels weird to just be in such a large mm -hmm. encompassing area where it's mm -hmm. almost difficult to get out as well. Mm -hmm. So be, you've really increased the scale on most aspects of this. Mm -hmm. And do you feel that be, that could lead to the childhood lens that you had of this space, mm -hmm. not only as it being an overwhelming emotional, psychological space, but also when you're little, things seem bigger. Yeah, exactly. Right? Um, so like that you decided to make the glasses massive and the plates massive and mm -hmm. the chairs. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you started with the ceramics and then you were like, okay, so I'm gonna make them larger. Mm -hmm. And then talk us through the table that you've constructed in these chairs because they're just fantastic. Yeah, the table, I definitely wanted sort of a easily recognizable table. So I went to Ikea and I took all the measurements from their table That's and chairs. And then I was like, I'll just double them in size. I ended up having to make them a little smaller because I realized the table would be five foot five and you wouldn't be able to see any of the ceramic. I wouldn't be able to see any of the ceramics. Mm. So there, it's actually a little shorter than if I truly doubled it in size, but I wanted something that was easily recognizable, something that I could also sort of do within the time frame, and just looked like a dining table from mm -hmm. afar. It didn't have to be complicated. Mm -hmm. You just look at it and you're like, oh, that's a dining table and mm -hmm. chairs and that's what I really just wanted. Yeah. I knew making them big would sort of get the emotional response that I wanted anyway, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, mm -hmm. I mean, people are definitely taken back when they come in here. Mm -hmm. um, so, but these are like, how, how did it go physically making this? Because fabricating these were, this is big. And we should say going into your BFA year, your medium, your mediums that you said you were, were. Mm -hmm. Fibers and ceramics were yeah. the two classes I took the most of. So yeah. I never took a sculpture class. I took like, I did, made a little train in high school and that was the last time I did wood sculpture. So it was definitely, there was a learning curve, but I watched a lot of videos and talked to Sasha, the sculpture professor, a lot about mm -hmm. how I was going to do what I did. And she brought up a lot of like tutorials that would be very helpful. Um, the terms of making it, I actually, by the time I was making the table, no longer had access to the wood shop. So some things were cut with a jigsaw, which mm. was a struggle. And then the rest, I either had Doug, who's a very kind man who helps out in the wood shop and helped me with a lot of the cuts I was making and then glued everything. And then I actually ended up having to take everything back to the garage in my family's house to finish it up because oh, I had run out of time at that point. So all of this, I think all the staining and a lot of the sanding happened in either outside or inside my, mm -hmm. my parents' house. Wow, yeah, that's, it's just really impressive that you didn't even have 
that as like installation wasn't necessarily your focus going into this year. And I think for those of you that are gonna be watching a lot of these artist talks from this exhibition, you'll see a lot of trends and how much it shifts in the year, let alone facing a global pandemic to shift your medium and how you're gonna be presenting it in an exhibition. Mm -hmm. So Amanda, you've been very ambitious and this is really amazing and spectacular. Mm -hmm. You've been able to accomplish such a large scale okay. work. Um, and we haven't even talked about the paintings that are on the side yet. And that's again, that was not a medium that you thought yourself, you didn't consider yourself a painter. No. And now you have these fantastic paintings that are on the, the sides of this installation that are adding mm -hmm. another dimension. So maybe let's talk about the paintings a little bit. And Chris, if you could, um, I know we have some details of the paintings if we wanted to pull those up to see those a little bit better. So. They're, they're flanking the sides of the table. And Amanda has also painted mm -hmm. to create more of an aura of like a, a domestic space here. But um, maybe let's start with the one in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And what is that? is that? Does that one have a title or is it all part of the? I didn't want to name all, any yeah. of them because I sort of wanted it to all seem like they were, they had to be together. But my affectionate name for it is Got Milk because that's what we hear all the time is, at least it was familiar from my childhood anyway. Uh, I actually, the main inspiration for that piece was uh, little Chrissy in Pecker when she is basically just downing a bunch of sugar in the kitchen and it's horrifying and, but also I found it very relatable. So the composition for that really inspired um, that painting because I wanted it to seem private uh, mm. in the dark, but also the viewer is witnessing it so it sort of becomes hmm. more of a like caught in the act situation which i really enjoyed because when like when i did eat in private it did feel sort of like this forbidden act and something that wasn't supposed to be visible to anyone hmm. else and hmm. so i sort of wanted to create a space where it was visible to someone else but also created a feeling of oh maybe this is private and maybe i shouldn't necessarily be looking at this so hmm. And I'm sure there's people that are watching this and listening that can relate to mm -hmm. familial eating habits that we're supposed to do, but mm -hmm. feel similar to you as like, that was never comfortable for me, or I've never mm -hmm. wanted to follow those societal expectations, mm -hmm. or, you know, it never, it never fit right, you know, yeah. and it doesn't fit for everybody. So let's talk about the piece with the food under the bed. Mm -hmm. And Chris, if you can pull that uh, painting up, that's a really, really attention gravity. I love the perspective that we mm -hmm. have of being under the bed and the individuals reaching. I mean, are these people you? I mean, would you say this is you I actually, or? I would, I wanted part of it to be, it's sort of me, but I also want it to sort of be this objective where the viewer okay. can also feel like they have experienced that. But I would say out of the two paintings, that was the most personal for me okay. because I did hide all of my food under my bed. Mm. It sort of became the place where food belonged for me. Mm. And so I remember recreating this painting and it feeling so weird because I was taking the reference photo and I was purposefully putting food under my bed and having my roommate uh, be the person that I was referencing. from. And it felt very strange because it was at, at a certain point very familiar because mm -hmm. it's what I did as a kid, but it was a for a completely different hmm. reason, where it was more of a commentary on that. Fictitious, like, I mean, like you were resetting. Yeah, yeah, which was uncomfortable, but definitely out of the two, I think that one I find the more personal painting hmm. to me. It was a piece of cake, Campbell's soup. Um, <laughs> yeah, so these things just kind of lived under your bed and that was like your yeah. sacred. Yeah, actually painting. went to the grocery store and just picked out all of the foods that I would sort of feel guilty eating. Hmm. And that sort of became what I decided to put Hmm. under my bed yeah. with a little bit of aesthetic choices as well. Yeah, so mm -hmm. clearly this work is really personal to you. Mm -hmm. This isn't just something that's aesthetically pleasing. You've decided in your BFA year to create a work that pushes your identity mm -hmm. um, and puts it in a very vulnerable space in an exhibition that's available to various audiences. What do you think it means as an emerging artist? You know, this is the BFA year is kind of the pivot of you starting your artistic career. Mm -hmm. What do you think it means or how has it meant for you to have such a personal body of work as your catalyst moving forward? What does it mean to start with this and yeah. how does it feel to have created this and accomplished this moving forward? 
It definitely feels sort of surreal at yeah. the moment because I had done other personal pieces, yeah. but I definitely had never, I never talked about food before this because it felt too private. Uh, so when I started, when I started this project, I knew I wanted to talk about sort of like loss, loss of innocence and adolescence. Uh, but then I decided like, you know, it's time to talk about food. It's what I want to spend the most time on. And that's what I have during this year. So that's sort of what became, and then I just kept going, and I was like, might as well, mm -hmm. <laughs> might as well keep going. And it definitely was almost cathartic because talking about it with so many other people, you get their you get their relationship with relationship with food, and you start understanding that it was sort of a universal experience for a mm -hmm. lot of people, where they look at it and they're like, oh, I can relate in this way, even though my mm -hmm. experience was slightly different, which mm -hmm. was really nice. Mm -hmm. And the, you would have never known that if you wouldn't have mm -hmm. created. Uh, of work that was available to the public exactly. you know if it was just a sketch in your sketchbook you only would have kept that in so mm -hmm. you know there's something to say about the arts and being an artist and be able to expose these hard truths or these realities mm -hmm. that you're shifting um, and I think it's really fascinating to think through that you are and you've accomplished controlling a space that you used to feel so out of mm -hmm. control of oh, um, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah right yeah so mm -hmm. Um, something that is really personal you're now controlling and experiencing and rethinking and renavigating. Mm -hmm. It goes to your childhood, but also very much to who you are today mm -hmm. and moving forward um, as an artist. Yeah. Um, so it's super powerful. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this BFA year for you. <laughs> um, so March is here. Mm -hmm. And I know I was doing studio visits with you guys. And I think even the the winter quarter was kind of shut down, couldn't do final critique in person, I don't mm -hmm. think. And and remind us, the BFA cohort normally, you're with each other all the time, mm -hmm. you're doing critiques all the time, you're always in a unit. And so now things have completely shifted. So what did it look like for you from March until now? For me, it was definitely, I had to reorganize my time. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people who are close to me know that I am not always the best at judging how long things take in general, even when we had 24 hour access yeah. to the studios. So now only being able to go on the go on campus around 18 hours a week sort of was like, oh, I need to start figuring out um, the important parts of this mm -hmm. project. I really want to get finished. And then I moved my paintings home and sort of created a studio in my bedroom, which was, inter which was interesting because it was like doing a personal, really personal work within a very personal space. Mm -hmm. But it was difficult yeah. to sort of reorganize how I thought I was going to spend the few months on this project. But I'm also, it's like bittersweet, but I also was able to spend more time on these paintings um, over the summer and sort mm. of be able to just get a little more comfortable with this project and how I wanted it to be displayed. Mm -hmm. So. There were some positives and some negatives. Right. I mean, even at the very beginning, you couldn't access the studio. Like yeah. it took time for the art department to be able to figure out how we could get you mm -hmm. access to the space. So yeah. um, major accomplishment. And we didn't even get to talk about installation, but I know it's time for mm -hmm. um, some questions from our audience. So um, Chris, if there is a question that feels extra timely or related to things we're talking about, please um, ask away and we'll, we'll go through those. There are, uh, and you know, those of you who are listening and, you know, forgive me if I, you know, if I allied your questions, I'm, I'm trying to group together some of the, the thoughts that people have had. Um, there were a couple of questions about um, the choices in terms of exactly how the installation came together, the choice to paint the wall, um, questions about the colors, the subdued natures of the colors. So um, it says the colors besides the painting are more subdued. Um, mm -hmm. Does this reflect feelings and memories of the dining room? Um, and there was another question related, how was um, the intention behind the choice of the wood as the building material, the dark color and staining of the wood and the framing. So mm -hmm. just sort of categorizing those together. Yeah. Yeah. Do you get all that? Yes. <laughs> it's a material process. Yeah. Um, well, for materials, I definitely, that sort of went with, I wanted to create a dining room that looks like a dining room. So creating a wood table just sort of seemed like, just made sense and made it the easiest process. In terms of color, I actually looked up just 
horror room, horror dining rooms. And really? Yeah, because I, I definitely wanted it to be dark and dramatic, and I really mm. wanted the lightest points to be the ceramics and then the highlights mm. in the painting to sort of create a lot of drama. Uh, and that definitely influenced the wall, the wall color and the table color, because I wanted a sense of drama and importance and mm -hmm. also to take the viewer away from a gallery sort mm -hmm. of setting and more of a, a room that's sort of separate from the gallery. So there, that was my main influence for that. And there's also a rug on the floor. There is a rug. Yes. Um, which obviously really changes the physical interaction of stepping into a space. Not only is it painted differently, but the feet pattern sound change when you walk in here and like the idea of pulling out the chair. So Amanda has really thought through every detail and color of this for obvious reasons. Go ahead, Chris. Well, and a related question to that was, did you encounter any difficulty in achieving depth and detail in the paintings, considering how dim the quality of the light is? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I had a few struggles. I think working in my bedroom that didn't have the best lighting to begin with sort of led me to be very scared <laughs> when installing these into the gallery, we ended up, um, my friend Ashley and I, who also has worked here and is going next, um, we experimented with lighting and mm. that's sort of when we put the spotlight on the paintings and it's just like, oh yes, that's, I, I sort of knew that I wanted a spotlight to really create another sense of drama, but then because they're so dark, I was very scared of how lighting was mm -hmm. going to look in general, mm -hmm. but it ended up just working out and coming together. Mm -hmm. And are you uh, still exploring these same topics and work that you're currently working on? Uh, yeah, I have a few smaller, considerably smaller pieces that I am sort of continuing thinking about food and eating. Uh, but I don't think any of them are as big or as emotionally complex as this one hmm. yet. But we'll see if I can. I might continue around this route, but I definitely want to continue ideas of adolescence and memory um, hmm. for the considerable future, Yeah, I can see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do you, some of the works that you are currently working on, some of the smaller ones, how do they differ? How has that idea changed maybe between the way you were thinking about the relationship in adolescence with the relationship in your current you know, in this current moment? Yeah, uh, at the moment, I'm actually creating a piece where I am making a quilt out of various candy wrappers and I wanna make bedspreads. So it actually differs a lot from this piece because in mm. here you see the food hidden, but I'm sort of contradicting that now and showing the food on top of a bed or mm. very like in public in the light. So I liked the idea of sort of switching it up mm. and seeing what meaning I could draw from that. Is that connecting the bed again mm -hmm. to eating habits? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. We, we have um, someone who would like to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Um, advice, I would say just start experimenting. I feel like I just, I would actually went into school thinking I was going to be only a 2D artist. And I didn't take a 2D class besides like the mandatory ones. So I would just say, let yourself just sort of fall into what you want to do. Uh, Cause that's been my favorite thing. Like I never thought I was gonna do ceramics or fibers or anything. And then it's mm. just sort of, I just kept going and ended up loving it. So that's been very nice and I would recommend it. Mm -hmm. So you felt open to explore a bunch of different mediums. Yeah, I just fell into random classes. I'm like, that looks fun. And then yeah. kept going and it worked out, I would say. So I think that's great advice. Mm -hmm. You know, explore all the mediums you can. Yeah. We're good with questions for now, Chris. Okay. That is all the questions that we have from the floor. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for tuning in um, and spending some time with Amanda and myself today and supporting these BFA artists. You know, we wish we could bring you in, but you know, we're thankful to be able to have this virtual artist talk so you all can experience the work in some regard. Um, and this will be available uh, later on. We have, we'll have a recording. So if you ever wanna come back to this 
Um, but thanks for being here again. You've been a part of the Western Gallery's BFA Artist Talk series, and we've been sitting here with Amanda Cartez. And again, thank you, Amanda, for your time. Nice. I know you're out of school. <laughs> you didn't have to come today, <laughs> but we really thank you. Um, and thank you for your work and that we're able to explore such personal narratives, you know, with our community and our Western community. Um, oh, yeah. Could you uh, show us the yeah, scale? I can. Yeah. I can in the chair. And like, I don't even know how it slides out. It slides out sort of interestingly. They're attached with like, the legs are attached with brackets, but it definitely is just not the easiest thing to. <laughs> Great, there you have it. Scale and material in Amanda's work. Pretty, pretty amazing. So <laughs> congratulations, Amanda. Thank you all. And we are next gonna be talking with Ashley McBride. So please stay on, go take a little break. We'll be showing some slides of Ashley's work as we uh, get ready to set up for our next artist talk. Thanks for being with us today.
Hi, welcome to our second day of our BFA Artist Talk series here at the Western Gallery at Western Washington University. My name is Tammy Landis. I'm a museum educator here at the Western Gallery, and I'm sitting with Ashley McBride, one of our exhibiting artists in Insight, A New Realism, which is the culminating exhibition for the BFA uh, graduating class of 2020. So thank you, Ashley, for being here on your own time. You've already graduated um, and is now the fall yes. <laughs> 2020, which was unexpected, but we're, we're really pleased to have this exhibition up mm -hmm. and to have this virtual series mm -hmm. with you all. So thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting these artists. Uh, what this will look like today, we'll chat. Um, I will chat with Ashley for about 20 minutes about the work that we see behind us. Um, and then we'll reserve about 10 minutes at the end for questions. So if you think of something while we're talking, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A function. My colleague Chris is on the other side monitoring those questions and will let us know if there's any that are more timely to something that we're talking about in the moment. Um, and there's also gonna be some images, uh, little higher resolution images that will be played throughout the talk. So you can get a few more details, especially with the nuances of this um, material that you see behind us that I'll have Ashley break down for us in a little bit. So thank you for being here. We're gonna go ahead and dive right into our artist talk with Ashley. Hello. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you for uh, letting us come into the space. I know yeah. it's a little difficult right now, but. Yeah. Um, well, it's important for us to celebrate you and celebrate this work in yeah. such a challenging year yes. and <laughs> that you've been able to get it up. So let's dive right in. So this work, that's behind us has several parts of it mm -hmm. that are not even necessarily on view because mm -hmm. parts of this work you've taken elsewhere and traveled with yes. it, but tell us the title <laughs> and then break that down for us a little bit. Yeah, so um, the title actually came kind of kind of late and I- What uh, is the title? Well, title Skin, the name is Skin, just Skin. Uh, and that title actually came after the fact that I started wearing it. Um, at first it was just gonna be a structure that was going to hang from, uh, from the ceiling and I was going to play with lighting. Uh, and then I had, I think it was right when COVID started mm -hmm. in March. I, you know, we're isolated in our houses and I realized that um, there wasn't much that I could do because the process of what I'm, mm -hmm. you know, how I made this was I was weaving and I was, um, you know, I could sit unlike some of the other artists here where they have to have a studio space. And so I wanted to go beyond the walls of my house um, and go outside. And I think that helped me understand my relationship with uh, the environment that I have to be in, um, not only in my house where I live, but outside. And uh, from there, be because I was wearing it, it felt, um, it felt more connected to myself. And then that's when it kind of felt like mm. skin. Like it yeah. So I remember earlier, so we could take a step back of how this work has evolved. Yeah. So going back to the fall mm -hmm. 2019, you starting your BFA year, mm -hmm. what ideas were you thinking about then? Mm -hmm. And how has this kind of evolved from that? I mean, I, I, I know recycled material mm -hmm. is something that's always been really important to you. And if if you all, if we were able to be in Ashley's studio, there's just recycled material everywhere. <laughs> Reuse, repurpose yeah. is something that is intrinsically really important to you as an artist and as a human, mm -hmm. I think. So it really crosses over to your life pattern. Mm -hmm. It's not just your work as an artist and here's your life too. It's very much overlapping. So take us to what you went into the year thinking you yeah. would create. Um, and then we'll talk more about yeah. it as that unfolds. Um, about two years ago, uh, there was a study abroad program where I was able to go to Japan. And when we came back, we presented work um, in the B Gallery. Mm -hmm. And I was doing painting at the time. And I came into BFA thinking I was gonna do painting. And I have no experience with painting at all. Um, and it ended up uh, being completely different. <laughs> Obviously, this is not a 2D piece of work. Mm -hmm. um, and some of you may know that a year ago I was making uh, baskets. I was taking um, reed and I was soaking it and weaving it and creating these sort of aquatic looking um, structures that I would hang from the ceiling and project light through. And mm -hmm. not only was I taking the skills that I was learning, especially in the last two years since mm -hmm. coming back from Japan, 
um, I started taking more fiber classes. Mm -hmm. And I started working with Seiko, the fiber and fabric teacher. And, um, you know, I think I, I like the idea of using my hands. And I think it's really important, those skills, to have them and work on them. I mean, you know, we wear clothes and someone makes them or a machine mm -hmm. makes them. Or, um, and I think the idea of taking material that is not usually, is either discarded, left behind, um, mm -hmm. and, and reworking it into something else mm, brought life to objects that you just wouldn't think mm. are mm -hmm. uh, like a basket, right? Yeah. Like it's a, it's a thing that you use, but instead I wanted to make it almost mm. Alive. Yeah, so I like, you know, I think in so many cases in this exhibition, a lot of your peers take function object, functional objects and represent them mm -hmm. as themselves, yeah. but you've stripped away the function mm -hmm. and created a new purpose mm -hmm. for these materials. And I remember um, early on when we were talking, maybe back in January, your, um, this material, you were building these yeah. like conical towers that you were going to have on the floor. Yeah. Now all of a sudden the floor is empty and yeah. we see that this is um, up and hanging from the air. So tell us about that transition of when you were thinking through structures and then you decided um, to have this be something that would be hanging mm -hmm. versus sitting on the floor. I think that when it's on the floor, it has a level of weight and it has um, a different uh, perspective. Obviously like looking below something, like if it, was, it, if it was going to exist on the ground and if I were going to do it, it would it wouldn't be very tall. Mm. And I think that I wanted to, um, just like with Amanda's work, make people feel a little disoriented, mm. um, making them actually want to go up to the work and then the work surrounds them, not the other way around, mm. where someone comes into a space and they're like, I am here. Mm. Um, same thing with like 2D work. When you go up to a work, it's there and it exists. And it's, you know, um, I think that the relationship that people have with sculpture is a different feeling. And I also was like extremely inspired by Sheila Hicks. I mean, all of her work, mine's not very colorful. Like so well-known <laughs> textile artist who creates She's monumental. amazing. She's like 80 years old and she makes these like beautiful woven, oh, it's just so many different things. And a lot of her work is hanging from the ceiling and, um, you know, cascading down. Obviously her stuff touches the floor. Um, but with mine, I don't know, I guess I, I, I wanted it to float. I wanted yeah. it to feel like, it was weightless, which it is. I mean, it's less than 10 pounds, this thing. I mean, mm -hmm. it's hanging my fishing line. Um, and I think that just gives it a different. Yeah. So it was like, it's, and to you, it sounds like what I'm hearing you say is the perception of the viewer mm -hmm. or the, the perception of people as they were going through this was integral in your planning of how this installation came mm -hmm. to be and how this final piece came to be. So, um, I would love, uh, Chris, could you pull up um, some of those images of Ashley's work that show the, the details of yes. this material? And could you tell us, what is this? <laughs> what, <laughs> what are we looking this? at? Uh, what are we, like, break it down for us, material. So this material is called Hex Web. Um, it's actually from a company called Hexel. I believe I'm getting that right. Um, it's actually based in Kent. The material is intentionally made for cars and like airplanes. The cardboard like material or mm -hmm. the white fiber? So okay. the white fiber is actually a material called Kozo. It's a mulberry bark, um, I think I said that right. Yeah, that's stripped out of a tree and then okay. um, processed. And actually you make paper out of it. Um, but the, the hex web is yeah. that um, cardboard like yeah. fibrous material. That's so um, the cardboard, it's just cardboard that is cut into the shape of honeycomb um, and like I said it's mostly used to make airplanes they make them lighter uh, you know not as heavy um, so a lot of aircrafts use them and so uh, this idea that this material was used for this like man-made metal object um, was really interesting to then use it as a different purpose and actually this material I found it in the art building um, it has been in the art building since the 80s um, we, I think the art building used to house a lot of the cars from the building over here. And so in the basement, there's stacks and stacks and stacks of it. And it was just discarded. Mm. And um, in the annex, the uh, sculpture studio, they had a couple stacks. And, you know, I was having a really difficult time conceptualizing something to put in the gallery, mostly because I was so dedicated to process mm. that I had a hard time 
committing to something, yeah. like knowing that I need to be in a gallery. Mm -hmm. uh, and so by taking, I, I found this material in that process of like, what am I going to do? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and the fact is that it's, there's holes in it. So I could weave into it and use these skills that I'd already learned and spent so much time learning. Mm -hmm. um, and actually with the work that I made a year ago, baskets, uh, I was dipping those in the Kozo material. Instead of making paper, like the traditional way um, that you would use that material, I thought, why not dip it? And I'm still using the same process of when you make paper by taking a mold and dipping it in water and the, the um, pulp. And um, through that process, like the hex web can only catch so many things mm -hmm. because the material is actually fireproof and waterproof. Yeah. So it was really difficult to work with mostly because it wanted a different, it wanted to work differently than yeah. what I wanted it to work. Yeah. Um, but not only was I using the weaving with the holes, but uh, dipping it in Kozo gave it, it was almost like connecting this industrial man-made material that was originally a tree at some point. And then connecting it with literally a tree, uh, mm. sort of like my artist statement, I wanted to understand what my place is as a human being in nature. And we can make man-made objects and, and do all these things, but what does that impact have uh, on the world around us and our environment? Mm. Um, yeah. let's, let's talk about your environment a little bit yeah. more and how it relates to this. And even as I'm sitting here, I don't know if you all can see it um, on the video, but some of the works are kind of spinning and they have a little subtle movement. Mm -hmm. And so there's this like kinetic mm -hmm. part of your work because it feels so weightless. It's so light. Mm -hmm. It moves depending on how things are going. And I, I think it's a really dynamic part. And there's also really fantastic shadows that are cast behind this piece that add another dimension mm -hmm. to it. But the idea of movement with mm -hmm. this work. Right now, it's kind of stationary, but before it was installed here, um, it had a lot of movement. You did a lot of it things moved a with lot. it. Yeah, so Chris, <laughs> if you could pull up some of the images of Ashley wearing the skin in different environments, mm -hmm. um, could you talk about that, taking this work yeah. before it was installed and activating it mm -hmm. in some regard, right, yeah. in environments before it was put up here? I mean, you see, you know, art is... You can only do so many things. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you could do a lot of things. But um, the idea of me making it and then being in it was completely new. And I think um, a lot of the times I have a hard time connecting myself with my art, mostly because, like, I don't dig too deep into, the, like, the personal struggles that I've faced, mostly because I would be really sad. And <laughs> that sounds, like, mm -hmm. bad. But, like... Um, I think making it about me, I mean, if you ask me why I made this work, mm. it's me, like I made it for me, but also my perspective is different than someone else's perspective. So by wearing it, it changed. It was almost like I was noticing this in a different light, in a different perspective, rather than this like, I mean, yeah. it's kind of flat. Yeah. Um, when you have movement, I mean, that's something so natural that we do as human beings, dancing and moving and walking and, and, and you know, some people, yeah, I think it, um, it brings life to an object that literally has no life, mm -hmm. but it was, mm -hmm. I mean, it was a, a tree at one point. Yeah. Um, and sort of bringing that material back to its roots. It means the same thing if I take cardboard or if I take plastic, it came from somewhere and adding myself into it I guess, yeah. made it more dynamic. Okay. Yeah. You know, and I think um, you mentioned earlier how it was hard for you to land on this idea. Yes. And I think that's really relatable because I know yes. that there's a lot of art students um, that are watching this that are interested in a BFA year and might be thinking the same thing. Like, how do I land on one idea and make that my final choice, you yeah. know? Um, but you've done it, <laughs> you know, thinking back to the fall, like you didn't think that would happen. And I think um, it's something that a lot of these artists go through of like, mm -hmm. what is that final work gonna look like? Um, but you were able to do it and you stuck with something that yeah. was really important to you. But coming back to um, the documentation of yes. this work, which is My a goodness. whole other element in the art world and the history of art and performance mm -hmm. art, you know, sometimes artists only have documentation of their work. Mm -hmm. so. Where do you see this going next? Do you want to continue to document it in other places? Do you want to leave it as is and keep 
the documentation to the spring in summer 2020, you know, to this specific moment. What, what's next with your piece, the skin? I'd love to get other people to wear it. I, actually, I, I made a video, um, which I know it's not in the slide. Um, and I had a video of my mom dancing in it. I didn't put it because I know she would be weird about it. And that's fine. It was adorable and I love it. Um, but seeing how I, I just gave skin to her, you know, at my house where mm -hmm. I live. And she just put it on and was dancing around. And, and I think this idea of giving skin to someone else and seeing what they do with it, whether they lay it on the ground, whether they huck it over a car, I don't know. Um, mm. I actually, I don't know if those images are in the PowerPoint, but uh, I, I would take skin and I would put it in a car and like set it up and make it look like it was driving. Uh, mm. And I think just experimenting with going above and beyond what your art and what you think it is. It's one thing to be in a gallery. It's another thing to expand off of that. And, you know, the hardship of it is this year was really rough. And mm -hmm. so my relationship with skin is really rough, mm -hmm. you know, like, I mean, it just reminds me of the beginning of, of COVID, like, yeah. and that's really hard to face and want to actually make more of it. Yeah. And honestly, I haven't touched any of the material. I mean, I have tons of it in my house, yeah. but um, knowing when you can keep going and knowing when you need to take a break is really important as an artist, because I think sometimes when you're, especially in an institute where you're you know, going to school mm -hmm. and making art, you, you're pressured to keep going and pushing and making things. And sometimes you just can't. And right. like knowing when to, uh, knowing when to know that, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. Important. And it sounds, what I'm hearing from you is that this work feels very relational yes. to you. And how interesting to have made this in a year that you couldn't have the work be as relational as you right. would have liked it to have been. Well, there's a little, like a lot of things that I wanted to do. We talked about adding color, you know, yeah. I, I was learning skills while also doing this. And that was really hard because in BFA, you're not only still learning, you have to make something. Yeah. You, you're presenting in a gallery in a year. Yeah. Um, and I had a hard time because I just wanted to keep experimenting and making things. Experimenting, and, yes. Yeah. That's something that. Yeah, well, and that's something that Amanda had mentioned as well. Um, you need to constantly Try something new. I mean, yeah. you know, like I collect a lot of trash and I make things out of that. Um, but also like I make digital art and also I make, you know, paper art. Yeah. And I think going back and forth and taking breaks into each uh, skill that you have is really yeah. important because I think sometimes we get so stuck on, on one skill mm -hmm. that you almost just wear it out and you don't want to sure. do it. Yeah. That's great advice, because I know that there's a lot of yes. younger artists that are <laughs> listening to this or emerging artists. Um, so I know we're kind of close to time when um, it's, we do have some questions. So I do want to allow some questions, and then I know I have some more things I could chat with Ashley with too. But Chris, if there's any questions that you'd like to elevate to Ashley and myself, we'd love to hear them. Yeah, there's um, um, a couple that are, Close, closely related, I guess. Um, how did you know when you were done creating the skin piece? And uh, do you right now see yourself making more pieces that are similar to that? I love it. Um, I wasn't done until I put it in the gallery. I'm not even, I'm still not done. I mean, <laughs> like I, I brought skin in and I didn't even have these hanging pieces. And actually in the process of putting this up, um, Doug, I don't know what his position title is, mm -hmm. um, but Doug, who works in the art building, uh, he had, we started hanging it and he had mentioned how cool it would be to attach things at the end of the fishing line from after hanging it. And I was like, oh my gosh. And that was like a week before we opened. And I was like, sure, why not? Let's add that. Um, you are never done, mm -hmm. <laughs> even if you put it and in And I the think gallery. that brings up a good point, right? So not only are you conceptualizing the work, but the process of installing it yeah, sometimes so can different. ultimately really yeah. change. Yeah. The work, especially a three-dimensional hanging piece right. like this, that's dependent on the space. This would have looked a lot different if we had decided to put it in a corner, absolutely, or in the center yep. of the space. Yep. You know, this um, work changes due to the environment, and I'm sure it, as you may exhibit it later mm -hmm. on, it's going to look yeah. different. As well, and depending what space. Uh, you're in depending on how people perceive it I mean that's why I've started wearing skin each environment whether I'm rolling around in the grass or on the beach or something like it has a different feeling and meaning and also like my perspective is obviously so different than 
what other people are gonna see. So yeah, I think definitely when I came to the gallery is when I kind of got close to finishing it. When you were forced to walk <laughs> yeah. away from it, maybe? <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah. that's when a work is done, when you actually- <laughs> When you're like, okay, I have to stop You're not allowed yeah, yeah, to yeah. touch it anymore um, when you're given the parameter right, right. of it. Yeah, um, close. now to the other uh, point of if I wanna make more, I think that's what the question was. Um, I have so much of this material. I actually use it for other purposes in my house. Like I made a compost on the side of my house and I took a piece of hex web and you know, rain can come through it because it's porous more or less. So I used that as the top of my compost. Um, but to make this, um, I, I, I mean, I, I like dipping things in Kozo. Mm -hmm. It's really gross and like the video that I have, you can hear the noises of it and the way that it's made is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And this idea of like taking something that you know is one thing, a plastic mm -hmm. bottle, a paper bag, uh, whatever, the netting on fruit, and dipping that into something and making it something you don't recognize yeah. anymore is really interesting. Like I've been taking um, the, the netting for fruit yeah. and I've been dipping it with different materials, whether it's Kozo or newspaper and mm. I put glitter in it and stuff. And I'm experimenting with not only the skills that I've learned at yeah. my time at Western, but what makes me happy yeah. rather than what makes someone else happy. Mm. So clearly your life and art, there's no boundary. <laughs> As we can see, Ashley, it's always working and continuing to think through these things. Or sleeping, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, I know we have another question. Go ahead. Um, there's two that are we can probably you know bundle together. Um, when you say that you dipped the piece in the Kozo, uh, what exactly does that entail? Yeah. And then are you worried about uh, skin breaking apart uh, under its various uses? Um, so when, you, when I'm dipping in Kozo, and um, some people know how to make paper and some people have no idea what I'm talking about. All it is is just a big like, tub with water. And then I take the paper pulp, um, which when you think about it, when you get paper wet, it becomes this sort of like, mm -hmm. I don't know how to describe pulp. Um, and I, I, I take pieces of it and I'll throw it into the vat that I have. And then I mix it around. Um, and when you usually make traditional paper, you're using a, a decal mold and you're, you know, you're scooping paper or you're scooping the pulp and you're making the paper. But instead of using that mold, I'm just using materials. And like I said, some of these materials are harder to catch the, the kozo. And then I let it sit and I let it dry and mm -hmm. it hardens and actually becomes uh, less soft um, mm -hmm. yeah what was the other question um are you worried about it falling oh apart? am I worried about it falling apart that's an important part in the yeah. art world like can some is it durable does it withstand are you okay with decay yeah honestly like when I was um wearing skin um and doing things with it in the last couple months it was definitely falling apart little pieces would come out but that's based on how I wove it um I actually like halfway through weaving it realized I was using string that was just not durable like you pull it and it immediately breaks apart so when I can't brought it in the gallery I was reweaving it and restructuring mm. uh, the integrity of it um, and that helped a lot I mean I had a nightmare that this thing actually fell apart until I wasn't here yeah because <laughs> um, you know it's being hung by fishing line and, yeah I mean it's not falling apart which is amazing but you're okay with a little bit of change as it morphs yeah, in different environments. I think that's why I called it skin because it is a living, it's me that I've, I've almost removed my mm. uh, aesthetic and my desires to create and, you know, mm. shedded my skin and hung it up. And if it falls apart, I mean, that comes with change, um, just like human beings, like we all change and grow depending on the environment we're in. So whatever gallery I take it to next may have a struggle when they fall apart. <laughs> I think that's a really great point to end on. I know we're at our time, um, but I think that's really fascinating yeah. you like demonstrating how the skin is like kind of visceral to mm -hmm. you. Like it, it really feels like a part of you. Mm -hmm. And I also know we didn't get to talk about it that it felt in some way protective thinking about yeah. COVID-19 yes. and protective wear and so having this other layer, but um, just it's it's um, striking how personal for a, a structure like this to be to you. So it's so nice that we've been able to have this yeah. talk to break that down a little bit because his, I think if someone were to only see a picture, they would never know yeah. unless they like scroll through all the things. Mm -hmm. So this has been really great. Um, 
to connect with you, Ashley. Thank you for yeah. sharing all of that. And thank you everybody for your questions and for your time and for chiming in today um, on our second day of our BFA artist talks here at the Western Gallery. Um, we hope that you can continue to spread the word and share about these talks with other friends and family and other colleagues um, as we continue to support and celebrate these artists and what they were able to accomplish in such a challenging year. Yes. Um, and if you have further questions or want more information about the exhibition, please go to the Western Gallery's website to see more information. And there's also a digital catalog that is available for you to review. You can see the artist statements, curatorial statements, and other high resolution images of the work. So thank you all for your time today. Yeah. And if you have questions, you can find my email also on our website. Or you can ask me, like I'm, <laughs> like if you literally like want to talk more about it, we can. I like, can connect you with yeah. Ashley, you <laughs> sent me an email. So thank you all. This is the end of today's artist talks. I look forward to seeing um, some of you mm -hmm. throughout the rest of the week in our other artist talks. Thanks for your time.